Well, lo and behold, pandemic hit. So nobody's allowed to have happened, a good time. Uh, no, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, actually, I think I booked this on March the 10th, and we were locked down by the state of Ooh, Pennsylvania. Your timing is impeccable. Government. This is the plaintiff, Norman Hargraves. He says he hired the defendant's limo company to take his daughter and her friends out for a night to celebrate her sweet 16 and had to cancel due to the pandemic. The defendant's being a real son of a gun because she won't refund his money, and that's so not cool. He's suing for $499, the money he's owed. This is the defendant, Amy. She says her contract is crystal clear. If a client cancels for any reason, they can rebook at another time. His wife called about rescheduling. He never did. He still has a credit, but she's not returning his money. She's accused of pooping out on a sweet 16 party. All parties, please get your right hand. What you are about to witness is real. The participants are not actors. They are actual litigants with a case pending in civil court. Both parties have agreed to drop their claims and have their cases settled here before Judge Marilyn Millian in our forum, the People's Court. People's Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Marilyn Millian is now presiding. Litigants have been sworn, Your Honor. Thank you, Douglas. You're welcome. All right, Mr. Hargraves, what happened here? Well, my uh, youngest daughter, she is uh, not one who likes large crowds. So we wanted to have uh, a surprise party for her, like we did for her sister the year before. So I researched and came with the idea of a limousine ride with her and up to, I think it was 16 or 18 of her closest friends. So it was a more intimate situation. 16 or 18, okay. Correct. Yeah. correct. Okay. And it was just her peers. So it was something that was... Uh, that she could do and enjoy just amongst her and her friends. So I like said, did some research. I uh, contacted the, the company. She explained to me, you know, what the price was and all the things that were, you know, involved in the trip. It was supposed to be a up to four hour trip, um, going various places. The driver would be at their disposal. They would be able to have uh, all kind of goodies uh, in the. I guess it was a limo bus. Um, and like soda and candy and things like that, and music, um, and just be able to go out and have a good time. Well, lo and behold, pandemic hit. So nobody's allowed to have happened, a good time. Uh, no, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, actually, I think I booked this on March the tenth, and we were locked down by the state of Ooh, Pennsylvania. Your timing is impeccable. Government. Uh yes, ma'am. Uh, your Honor. Uh, it was and March when, the 14th. when was her birthday supposed to be? May the 7th, but we had planned this for the next day because it was a Friday, May the 8th. Right. Uh, so you paid in full, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, or ma or yes, you paid partial. All right. And then what happens? Then we go to lockdown. Then coronavirus hits and sucks all the fun out of life. And then what happens? Do you talk to her so, and tell her, or, hey, you know? Uh, yes, ma'am. So I contacted her, uh, I believe it was like April the 8th or April the 10th. And I said, um, are we going to be able to do this? Or can I, I think what I actually said was, can I have a refund? Because I don't think we're going to be able to do this. And she said, no, but what we can do is we can reschedule. And I thought, okay, well, I guess we're going to see how long this is going to last because it's once again, we're at the beginning of this. And we have no clue as to how long this is going to go on. So uh, we got further into it. We went through April into May. So I actually contacted her again and said, uh, well, what can we do now? And she said, well, we can reschedule. So I think it was July the 24th or the 27th was when we were going to reschedule. So we rescheduled. So as we got closer to it, once again, we're still under lockdown orders. Our governor doesn't want us going anywhere or doing anything. Was your governor going anywhere and doing anything? Because I've noticed that a uh, lot of the governors who didn't want us going anywhere and doing anything were going places and doing stuff. Uh, yes, ma'am. Actually, he did. He went to a couple of Black Lives Matters marches and you know, without a mask, by the way, and a whole bunch of other things. Without a mask. Or, or we have governors who went to see their family for Thanksgiving or we have, you know, it's just 
We need to end this turmoil. So let me just ask you, you, you tried to set it up for July, and what was the problem in July? So when I contacted her in July, she said, well, there are some issues, and part of it being we can only do it for this time frame. They can only go this, this within this distance. They can't have any of the goodies that they were promised, and uh, they can't, uh, there was one more thing. I think we they couldn't have, have the same number. They have to wear a mask. Number. Yes. And they can't, yes, you had to have a, lo a lower number of people and no, no goodies and no mask removal. All right, talk Correct. to me, Ms. Amy, um, talk to me. I have to imagine that of all the industries to be affected, uh, just like venues and party planners and caterers, your industry and restaurants, of course, your industry was probably Correct. hit pretty hard. Very, very So much. what have most of your clients done? What has been the solution? 99% of them have rescheduled um, or just accepted the additional six months of credit on top of the year that we usually give to, to them. Um, and okay. so, and they so can that's use good that. for you. I mean, it would be better to have been able to do those contracts and do new contracts, but at least, you know, 99% of them, you know, decided to do that. Well, he, Mr. Hargrave is in the 1%. And he wants his money back. So let me hear from you on that. So originally, before the pandemic, of course, um, our policy was if you cancel 45 days prior, you would get a full refund. If it's within the 45 days and we can find a, somebody else to rent that vehicle, then we would still give you that full refund. If it's within the 45 days and we cannot find anybody, you would have use up to one year in any of our, for any of our vehicles. When the right. pandemic hit, of course, we were shut down five days later, unfortunately. I did send a letter to all of our future customers uh, stating that in addition to the one year that we do provide credit, they would have an additional six months to use for any of our vehicles for nights out, trips to the airport, et cetera. And so right. things just kept on piling on with closures. And how long were you closed? Um, well, technically, we're not all the way open yet. Here's the thing, though. I realize that it is through no fault of your own that this happened, but it is also through no fault of Mr. Hargraves. And I'm just kind of wondering why is it that he should be out the money? I know you offered him the July date. How was the July date different than what he contracted with you for? July was supposed um, to be with what kind of precautions? Um, according to uh, Governor Wolf's declaration, it w we could only have 25% of individuals indoors. Everybody in, in a small limo bus, as you can imagine, that's a very tight space. Everybody would have to keep a mask on. And there was no restriction as to how far they could go. That was never a, a restriction. However, what was restricted was what they could what they could eat, drink, and what we could provide inside the vehicle, which is complimentary anyway, but we do allow people to bring goodies and snacks and things on the vehicles to to enjoy. Right. So now they couldn't do that. They couldn't take their masks off and how many people could be on the bus? Twenty five percent. So approximately five people, four people. Right. You, you realize how that's not a real option for them, right? To have five people on a party uh, bus. I, mean, I sure do. I'm I all, sure listen, do. I, I believe that when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. And I am all, I am presently in the throes of attempting to make sure that my child's high school does a graduation for my child. I had two graduates in 2020, a college graduate and a high school graduate. I am in the throes of, you know, trying to see if there can be a faux prom. So I am always all for, you know, trying to recreate whatever life stole from you in the best way that you can. It's hard to recreate the C Sweet 16. Yes and no, you can recreate it. It's much harder to recreate a faux prom uh, you know, with these kids already in college. They, you know, it's the parents who want it. I'm not even sure the kids want it, but I don't, see how when push comes to shove, it's his decision. And when it's his decision and he looks at it and says, listen, this ship sailed, you know, the celebration's over. I don't have a use for a party bus. I, you know, I, I did what I could. And 
I tried in July, even that didn't work. And even today, are you are you able to provide that party today to him or you still can't provide that party that he signed up for? Are you still yes. under restrictions? Yes, we can provide it, yes. Welcome back to the People's Court. I'm Harvey Levin. Plaintiff wanted to do something nice for his daughter, but the defendant threw a monkey wrench in the plans and he is pissed. Let's go back into the courtroom. Just recently, they've changed the uh, restrictions and you can have 50% now indoors. Oh, 50% now inside. And, and uh, yes, I thought you said you were, are you at full capacity, Ms. Amy, or no? No, we are not at full capacity. No. But we could still provide yeah. a vehicle. That is correct. Yeah, I know, but he doesn't want wheels, you know? He doesn't need a vehicle to go to the airports. He doesn't need a credit. He needs you to provide what he contracted for, which you can't. And I understand that it's through no fault of your own, but in the end, it's through no fault of his either. So this is what we call in the law impossibility of performance. Typically speaking, you don't have refunds except under certain circumstances. But this isn't that situation. In the end, you can't perform what he hired you for, so you've got to return the money to him. And I realize that may feel unfair to you, but it's also unfair to him. And so what the law does is it looks at your contract and it says, okay, was this envisioned in any way and accounted for? And of course it wasn't because who knew that this would happen? And a lot of contracts from here on in um, have now taken stuff like pandemics into account, uh, which is crazy to me. But um, so... Based on what I'm hearing and based on the facts of this case, this is one where I am going to order you to return the money. $499, verdict for the plaintiff. Good luck, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. So the plaintiff will get his money back. Amy, uh, the defendant, let me ask you, are, are you surprised at the judge's verdict? Um, I'm neither surprised nor dis not surprised, I guess. This pandemic has put everybody in such a disarray that... Who, everything's up in the air now. All right. Well, unfortunately, you're going to have to give the money back. Have you had many instances like this where you've had to give money back or not? No, this is the only one so far this year. Well, I guess you better hope no one sues you. <laughs> no one else sues you because it might end <laughs> Absolutely. Up the same way, Absolutely. You know? All right. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Hargraves, congratulations. Feel uh, better? Thank you, Mr. Llewellyn. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I had no hard feelings uh, all along. My only contention was I was just trying to do something to be a good father to my little girl. And I feel ultimately bad because it backfired on her. I do feel bad for the service oriented uh, industry. They've been hit hard. Yeah, they sure have. All right. Thanks. Good enough. Harvey, let's get your take on this case. You know, Doug, I love this because what the judge said is that you can't just say, oh, I'll give you another limo ride because it was specifically for a Sweet 16 party. You can't say, well, have another fake Sweet 16 and take a limo. It's not the same thing. She lost out on the experience, and that's why they get their money back. Judge Millian, when is it too late to sue someone for money owed? The money has been owed since about 2014. Um, well, every cause of action, every lawsuit has a different statute of limitations, and it also depends on, on states. Right. If you're suing someone over negligence, let's say over a car accident, it may be, you know, in some states it's only two years, in some states it's four years. If you're suing someone over a debt, that's a little bit um, more interesting and trickier. What are the Bec variables that could affect it? Re-establishing the debt. Like, if you are trying to collect from me, and I keep putting you off, and I, I say to you two or three years, let, let, let's say that you're in a state where the statute of limitations is four years. Let's right. say after year three, I say to you, listen, I just need more time. Can right. you please just, I'm kind of reestablish, I'm not kind of, I am reestablishing the debt. And then the clock starts again. Right. So, um, so long as you can prove that there has been back and forth between you folks in the last X amount of time, the Maybe statute of limitations. recent payment. Yeah, either a recent payment or a recent text agreeing to pay or anything right. like that, that starts the clock over. This is the plaintiff, Tammy Williams. She says the defendant, her roommate and friend, owes her money for rent because he skipped out on her and moved back home. She can't afford the place on her own. The defendant has put her into a bad financial situation because he's as irresponsible as they come. And she's suing him for the $3,815 she's owed.
This is the defendant, Dakota Calfer Khan. He says the plaintiff had a list of rules she wanted him to follow, like no random hookups in the apartment. She's a hypocrite, though, because she met a guy online and he moved in with them. The plaintiff made it uncomfortable living there. He moved out, and he owes her nothing. He's accused of taking off. The defendant has filed a countersuit for $700 for paid rent and security. All parties, please raise your right hands. Welcome back to the People's Court. Next case on the docket, the plaintiff says her former friend and roommate uh, owes her money because he skipped out on her without paying the rent. But the defendant says the plaintiff was a dictator with all these draconian rules and no one could live with her. It's the case of don't tell me what to do. Thank you, Douglas. You're welcome. Okay, Ms. Williams, how did you and Mr. Crawford Hahn know each other? We worked together at a previous job, and he was a team lead, and I was a um, payment verification self specialist. Okay, and then you decided to move in together um, to be roommates? Yes, I was moving to Texas out of in anyway before Mr. Crawford Hahn decided he wanted to go to move to Texas, first time out of the state of Wisconsin. So he's like, okay, yeah, we could do this half and half on everything. That's correct. Okay. And so what happens? You rent an apartment, and what happens? Uh, I rent an apartment. Um, I get everything. We go half and half. Uh, the There was no deposit. It was a prorated uh, amount because we moved in on June 15th. We were doing fine going along paying rent. Uh, we were splitting everything in half, the electric, um, rent, everything was in half. And then... Um, he had some issues with his vehicle. He moved out. I did meet a guy online, but he came. His truck broke down on the way. He didn't have a way to get back to Mississippi. He stayed here for three weeks and left. And then Mr. Carpenter decided he wanted to move out, saying that he was going to go back home to Wisconsin because of his grandfather passing, grandmother being ill, things of that nature. And his car got repoed, and he had to stay at a friend's house up the street to take an Uber to work and he couldn't stay here. So he decided to leave the day before rent was due. Okay, let's back up a second. Let's back up a second. You, you meet a guy online and the guy comes to visit and stays three weeks. What three weeks was that? It was what month? November the 5th, he, he came because his truck broke down on the way here. So November the 5th, and then three okay. weeks after, he got, he got a job. So was he still living there? Was the defendant still living there with you when the guy comes and stays for three weeks? Yes, ma'am. He was here, and he was going to work and, and things of that he, nature. He was here. Okay. Now, according to you, Mr. Coffert Han, you decided to move out. Why? Um, she was correct that it was about, like, my car did get repoed, and a few other things happened. But it was mostly, I was staying there way be, um, because of that type of living situation that she presented. Because I didn't want to be the jerk that said, no, you can't have your boyfriend live with us. When she had all these rules um, for like, you can't have hookups, um, no boyfriends or girlfriends allowed, um, things like that. And it just kind of put me into a position where I didn't want to be the mean guy that says, no, you can't have the guy that broke down to Mississippi to come and live there. So... That also put me in an awkward position because I just didn't want to be the guy that was like... Right, but what reason did you actually give for no longer... Because you didn't stay there in November, but you paid November rent. You didn't stay there in December, but you paid December rent. You didn't stay there in January, but you paid January rent. Where were you staying those months? I was staying with a friend because I didn't. she didn't give me any type of reason that her boyfriend left or anything like that. So... It was mainly as well as yeah, but her why didn't you go? Uh, did you ever go back there and see that he was no longer there? Or you never? I'm just gonna, I'm no. Ms. Ms. Williams, I need you to stop with the bobbleheading. I'm talking to him I'm now. Fine. I just need to. All I'm right, fine. can can you just explain to me if you never went back there? There is none so blind as he who will not see. In other words, if you want to get out of paying rent because the situation was unlivable because she had some strange guy in your face, that's great. But you got to prove to me that that's why you decided to stop living there. I've actually got a situation that's a little bit different because I've got you living somewhere else but paying rent there for months. Why were you living in that other place? Because it was closer to work? It was that, but again, it was back to that other situation. So 
I just well, you got to prove that. And did you ever send her a text or an email or a note or anything? Did you ever have a conversation with her where you told her this guy's got to go? Anything like that? No. All right. So now February. So why did you keep paying rent in November, December, and January? What was your plan? Um, my plan was to figure out how to get back to Wisconsin, and I just figured it was easier if I just paid at both of the places to help with the anxiety that I got from the whole situation and then just planning on quitting my job and then with my car being repoed, I just had to get try to collect all the eggs at once to figure out what the heck I was going to do. Okay. All right. So when did your car get repossessed? <laughs> uh, that was on January 1st because that's when I got back from visiting my family in Wisconsin. Okay, and now Wisconsin all of a sudden didn't look so bad, right? Right. You're home for the holidays, everybody loves you, There, you've got rides, so then you decide you're gonna go back to Wisconsin. You tell her on the 31st of January that you're gonna go back. Why did you tell her so late in the game? You really hadn't made the decision yet or you weren't ready to go to leave yet or? It was basically of the decision of just everything and I was just like you know what I'm just gonna head on out. Are you still there Ms. Yes, Williams? Yes I am. Yes. And what efforts have you made to get a roommate because it's a two-bedroom right? Yes it is and okay. I asked so like other, other people that I work with and things of that nature but no one's wanting to move in. This is not the best apartment in the world we found it online so that's why I wanted to move out early even with uh, Mr. Kaffernheim here we had already discussed moving out because my uncle's ill, I was going to move in with my uncle. He was going to get his own apartment. That was all discussed ahead of time. I also offered Mr. Kaufman, let me know in advance. Just let me know in advance if you're going to move out. Even I asked And what would you have done? So let's say in a perfect world he had let you know and he had told you, listen, I'm homesick, I want to go home. What would you have done then? Same thing you're doing now or I would you have done something differently? I would have had to have broken my lease and moved back with my uncle and them earlier than needed and try and pay out the lease, but I'm trying but, not but to But you have haven't that done that PC. now. Right, but you, yeah, you, you haven't done that now. You haven't moved out, so I don't, do you intend to move out? Because I don't think you do. I think you're gonna live it out. I'm trying to figure out what no, you're doing. Oh, in, in August, yes, I plan to move out. That is correct, yes ma'am. That was already discussed and mm -hmm. I don't wanna live in this apartment anymore. But also don't wanna be sued. My uncle told me if I can help it, don't break the lease because of all that's gonna follow you, your bad credit, and then trying to get a house or anything else is gonna be on your credit for seven years. And that's why I've been struggling and fighting it out, trying to stay here right. and make sure I could. But also the, the best thing that you can do, and, and it may not be very comfortable, but the best thing that you can do is try a little harder to get a roommate to help pay. Because I don't buy what the defendant is saying that the reason he had to move out is because all of a sudden you brought it, you know, you brought in a new person and that's why I moved out. That's not why I moved out. He moved out because he was having car trouble. It was closer to his job. He was with friends. He was happier there. He kept paying you rent. Um, which shows me that it wasn't uninhabitable for him having that stranger there. Um, I believe you when you say it ended up being temporary. He didn't even know because he no doesn't go back. He pays you rent in November, he pays you rent in December, he pays you rent in January. So the question becomes then, what happens from February to August? And we have this concept in the law called mitigating your damages. That means you try not to bleed to death, okay? You put, a, you, you, you put a tourniquet and you try to stop that. So your uncle's right. You don't want bad credit following you. But, you know, you could do a little something, something to help yourself and try harder to get a roommate. So I understand yes. asking for, say, February, maybe even March, because it should. maybe it takes you 30 days or 60 days to find an acceptable roommate. You don't just want to find anybody and put anybody in there. I get that. But why would it take you six months? Like it wouldn't, you know, I understand that he made an agreement to rent until the end of August, but you also have an obligation to stop the bleeding and try to get another roommate. Um, so what I'm going to do is yes, I am going to order the, 
Yeah, I'm going to order the defendant. How much was the rent? Four fifty each. Yes, the nine oh nine is the base rent without the utilities. That's correct. And I did get a second job, Your Honor, to try to stop the bleeding because it, I haven't. Oh found God a bless roommate, you. So I had to. Yes, ma'am. Have you tried putting? I mean, have you tried putting a notice in the paper? You just don't want to go that way, like on on Zillow or on Craigslist, or you just don't want to. I understand. I mean, that's fine. And those are choices we make in life. And I get it. I get it. The thing is, I can only award you what you're legally supposed to be getting, and um, I, I'm going to find that under these circumstances, you should have at least 60 days to find somebody new. I'm going to order him to pay you 450 for February plus 450 for March plus a ninety dollars in late fees that I know you had to pay on each of those for a sum total judgment in the amount of one thousand eighty dollars. And you got to be kidding! You have a counterclaim against her. When you left her high and dry like that, I don't think so. Zero on the counterclaim. Good luck, folks. Thank you. So the plaintiff is going to get just over $1,000 back from the defendant. We'll see how uh, she feels about that in a moment. Mr. Kafir Khan, you owe her that money. What do you feel about it now? Yeah, after the hindsight, you know, I, I do agree with the, the ruling. But again, it's just the whole situation was just kind of messed. So... We had rules, and she didn't want to follow them, so it is what it is. All right. I hope you like it going back home to Wisconsin. All right. Good luck to you. Ms. Williams, you. Uh, how do you feel? I know you were suing for almost $4,000. You know, you're just getting over $1,000. How do you feel about that? That's perfectly fine. I mean, I offered to pay him to pay $350, and that would be the end of it. But he ignored me, and he wouldn't reply to my reply. Um, my text message. So $1,000 better than the $350 I offered him. Yeah. All right. And the judge gave you some good advice on how you should handle things right now. How do you feel about that? You think you're going to be able to do that? Maybe find another roommate? No, I'm not looking. Never, ever any more roommates. No, no more. All right. Well, good luck to you. I hope it works out for you. Doug, the judge talked about mitigating damages. That means mitigating is another word for minimizing your damages. That means you just can't sit in your hands and let the damages accumulate. In a situation like this, if somebody skips out and they shouldn't have, you still have a duty to try and find another roommate and minimize your damages because once that new roommate starts paying rent, uh, the damages stop. And you have a duty to do that. And if you don't do it, you could end up losing the case. The question is, John, do you follow Marilyn's advice? Ha! Oh, <laughs> we might have differing opinions on this. The answer is, it depends on what the advice is about. When it comes to emotional intelligence, you've got it. And I absolutely don't. In fact, you have it in spades. So... If it's anything that has to do with um, friends or family that has an emotional component, I go to you, you're my lodestar 100% because I'm lost without that kind of advice, uh, the psychological stuff. Um, but if, if it's, you know, how do you tie a clove hitch or how, how do you tie a sheet bend, a knot or something? All those well, useful things, person. all those useful things, right? <laughs> the things that... Exactly, exactly. So, you know, we kind of, and I do have some of that, pr I can tie a lot of knots and I know how to do that. Stuff. <laughs> so it's like that we try to, stay, <laughs> try to stay in our own lanes, right? Right. This is the plaintiff, Audrey Chang. She says she parked in a parking lot and the defendant hit her and then left the scene. She got his information from the cops. And when she asked him to pay for her damages, he refused and said she was parked over the line. So it was her fault. Huh? She's suing for $195.65. The amount she's out for the accident. This is the defendant, Sean. He says he did dent the plaintiff's car, and then he called the police to report it. The plaintiff, however, was parked over the line. She went through her insurance, which paid her claim, and he owes nothing because she was the one who was negligent. He's accused of running out of space. All parties, please raise your right hands. 
Welcome back to the People's Court. Next case on the docket, the plaintiff says the defendant lost his temper while parking his car, and he intentionally sideswiped her car, which sounds almost criminal if true. The defendant says that the plaintiff was illegally parked over the line and accidentally scraped her car. It's the case of tight squeeze. Thank you, Douglas. You're welcome. Okay, Ms. Chang, what happened? Um, that was the early morning. I went to summit to take a course and I parked in a designated parking lot and I went to the class. Uh, later on, I got a call from the police, uh, you know, telling me I identify it was my car and to tell me that my car was got hit, uh, summoned me to the, the parking lot. So I made the police. And hit. then was, was the defendant still there or the defendant had left? He was not there. So you go down, and how bad was the damage? The damage, my insurance paid out the, the repair altogether about $3,000. Wow. Ooh, yeah. That's uh, the whole side of the car. That's like you kept driving and weren't okay. sure how to disconnect, Mr. Sean. Like, I'm, I'm wondering, you tell me, how did this accident happen? The spaces in the lot are ridiculously tight, and I hit her car. I told you, you, the police. But I mean, you hit her car, but good, like all the whole side. So it kind of means that you kept driving after the hit and continued to scratch it. Did you panic or something? Or what, what, were you trying to straighten no, up? Because it wasn't like you made contact and stopped. It's like you made contact and then kept going. Um, what kind of car were you driving? I drive a Ford Edge. Is that a car or a truck? I have no idea. It's an SUV. You're trying to squeeze your SUV. I think you were trying to squeeze about 10 pounds into a five pound bag. It was very tight. That said. So then how, her, and I presume that her car was parked, right? She wasn't driving it? Her car was parked. Okay. Um, it, it and your insurance really company nice paid the three grand for her damages. Correct. Now, first of all, this has thrown me for a loop. You actually went through your own insurance, Ms. Chang, right? Correct. And then you paid your deductible, but his insurance was legit. Why didn't you just go through his and then you wouldn't have to pay the deductible and, and seek it later and everything else? That's always the better way to do it is to go through his insurance. Uh, he, you know, uh, the, because in the beginning, I did contact his insurance company. That company was intimidating. He tried to blame me on, you know, the accident as my fault. That's the reason why I went to my insurance, asked them to, okay. you know, okay. to do the claim okay. for me. Since, yeah, you know, that's fine. Okay. So, so that's why happened. And then your insurance company went ahead and either sued or subrogate, you know, they, they took your claim against his insurance company and they said, hey, this is your client's fault, you need to pay up. And apparently the insurance company did pay you 400, his insurance company paid you back Four hundred and seventy-five of the five hundred dollar deductible. Is that correct? Correct. Why? Yes. Why? What bureaucrat at your insurance company? What are they thinking? Just, Just twenty-five dollars. They 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 needed to to anger her over twenty-five dollars of her, of her deductible. So you're suing for that twenty-five dollars because you don't feel it's your fault, and you're also suing for a car rental. And Mr. Sean, tell me why it is that I shouldn't order you to pay that. I got a letter asking not for the car rental, but for the insurance for the car rental. That's what it states on the letter that I received September 7th. So here Friday, is a May September 9th. 7th letter, but that seems to be directly from her to you. Correct. Hope and you and your loved are doing well in this crazy blah, blah, blah. I'm writing to for your help on the balance when you hit my parked car. It says balance of deductible insurance for car rental. Yeah, that's not, I don't know why you would have said that because it's the, I'm looking at the bill, it's the actual car rental, $16 a day. It couldn't have been more reasonable. And then your response is, I have enclosed photographs showing your car was clearly parked over the parking line, not allowing enough space for me to park the vehicle. Yeah, that was, I will not be submitting um, payment. Well, well, well. That so was, it's uh, her parked car's fault for being. No, it is. There. Is this the? Is this what you mean that her car made, was parked a little bit over the stripe? It's 
over it and it's a tight squeeze. Those spaces were like. Yes, it is a tight squeeze. That's why you shouldn't be they, parking there. You need to, you're gonna need to drive further and walk. It's really healthy for you. Tell me how her tires being a slight bit over the stripe, and this is an unusual stripe because instead of being a stripe, there's a buffer zone. It's an actual U shape. So your car to hit her had to be over the stripe and you're the one in your car with eyeballs that work, right? How, this is the hill really you want to die squeeze. on? $25 and the car rental? I mean, no, it's you know. not about the $25. It was, I, I was, I submitted this to my insurance. The insurance company negotiated that I was 95% at fault. And when, when this accident happened, I contacted the plaintiff and I said, do you want to handle this through insurance? or not through insurance. And she said insurance. So I just said, okay, then let insurance handle it. You know? And that's fine. Um, but I am not bound by what insurance handled. People, in other words, if your insurance company only, unless she signs something with your insurance company, which she didn't, because she went through her own insurance company, she is entitled to, because that's how you resolve something with insurance companies. If you want the check, then sign here that we're settling. And then there's no court ever after that. But that's not what happened. She went through her own insurance company. She's at $195.65. And she's come to me to prove to me that the accident's your fault and you should have to pay for it. I do not find you 95% responsible. I find you 100% responsible. I see that her tire's on the stripe. I, I have eyeballs. I see that. But you have no business trying to get an SUV into a tight squeeze that ends up causing that amount of damage all the way through the side of the car. And by the way, in order for you to damage the side of her car, you had to be well over the stripe that you're complaining she was over. I am finding in the plaintiff's favor in the amount of the $195.65. Now, Mr. Sean, there's a reason you pay insurance premiums, and that's so that you don't have to pay anything. So you submit that to your insurance company, and you tell them the judge didn't agree with them. Good luck, folks. Thank you. Well, the judge finds for the plaintiff she will get her $195 back. Sean, the defendant in this case. Sean, I have a question to ask you. You know, a lot of people in this situation would not have reported that to the police. They would have just gone on their merry way, backed out, and left. Did you ever think twice about that? No. No. I, I, my, my intention was, was to, I hit her car, and I wanted to be responsible about it. Well, good for you. Congratulations. <laughs> A lot of people would not have done that. Anyway, it's going to cost you $195, so that's what you get, okay? All right, Ms. Chang, let me just ask you a question. Obviously, you were surprised when the cops called you, but you decided to bring it to court for $195. You, you glad you did that? Yes, I sure did, yes. Because mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it is, you know, the money it shouldn't be out of my pocket. So thank you. I think that's a really just, justice is served. Very good for you. Justice is served. Okay. When I pull into a parking lot and the spaces are super narrow, instead of trying to shoehorn my car or my truck, whatever it is, into the space, I just keep driving, as you know, and I'll, I'll park like a couple well, blocks Well, you'll do that away. even if there are parking spaces uh, that are sufficient because you don't maybe. want anybody touching your car. Yeah, that, that might be true, but, you know, I, I'd rather walk in the rain than have to try to shove my car into something. You can't even get your door open when you're in those really yeah, tight I, ones. I mean, he's clearly in the wrong. And, and, you know, it's funny because Doug mentioned in the hall that, you know, did you ever think about, about leaving? And um, the defendant is a decent man, and, I, and in my head... I, you know, I, I don't, I don't really give brownie points for doing what you're supposed to do. But right. Doug's right. Like, there's a yeah. lot of, of terrible people in the world who would have left. But, but that's not even up for they're, discussion they're, because they're, he would never do that. Here's the thing, though. It, it was kind of odd that he chose that hill to die on. I know, considering all these five bucks after all he's been through. And, you know, <laughs> had to, had His to insurance shell, rates probably went up because, yeah. Right, yeah. but clearly compensable, and and she wasn't encroaching into the space no, next to her. She wasn't. She was just a team. And if bit. she is, don't park there. Barry wants to know this. Hey, Harvey, um, look at this picture I found on the internet. Did Judge Wapner really sell root beer? <laughs> he did not sell root beer, but we actually did this when he got his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Uh, so good luck finding it, though. <laughs> See you next time.